Hi, I'm Dr. Arthur Bradley, and today I'm going to talk to you about the COVID-19 coronavirus, just some observations that I've made, as well as some basic preparations that you might consider making. All right, so let me start off by saying I'm not a medical doctor or a virologist. My doctorate is in engineering, okay, so take my advice accordingly, all right? I'm not a medical professional. What I am is a concerned citizen, and so I'm sort of addressing it citizen to citizen. Now, that's the, the manner in which I'm approaching you today. I'm also not a doomsayer. I'm not out preaching that the world's going to end and everybody needs to retreat to a bunker. What I want to do is just kind of educate people a little bit and then maybe offer some food for thought and how they might get better prepared. All right? So let's start off with some of my observations. So the first thing is today is February 23rd, uh, 2020, and the current count as of this morning was 78,966 people infected around the world, about 2,468 dead, and about 23,418 recovered. All right, so that's where it stands at a moment in time. Now, by the time you watch this video, those numbers could be doubled or they could be up by just a little bit. All right, so we'll watch and see. But that's just a snapshot. So what are some of my observations, all right? And you may agree with these or you may disagree. Most of these are sort of confirmed. There's a couple of things that are a little bit more rumor. The first one is that nobody knows how bad things are going to get, all right? Depending on who you listen to, you know, a third of the population is going to die off because this is going to destroy humanity or it's going to be a minor blip in the overall grand scheme of things and it'll just disappear by the time warm weather comes. Um, I suspect the truth is somewhere in the middle, like most of things, but I do think it's something worth watching and I do think it's something going to be very different than what we're used to with typical uh, outbreaks of the flu. All right, so keep in mind though that nobody really knows yet. We're very early in this thing. We don't know how bad this is going to get. The second thing is that experts aren't really sure yet of the lethality of it, what the mortality rate of it is. If you just look at those numbers, the rate is right at around 10% today, that the 10% of the people you know, are going to end up dying versus being re recovering from it. All right? Now, I know those numbers are skewed because of the early infections are done differently, uh, and it doesn't roll into those numbers quite yet. So that number will likely come down and come down. Experts are predicting a mortality rate of somewhere around 2%, which is much, much higher than the standard annual flu. Um, but even if it's not 2%, maybe it's between 2 and this 10 that, that is currently is now, let's say it's 5%. You know, a 5% mortality rate outbreak of a, some type of a flu virus um, would be world changing. It would really affect uh, a great number of people, it would overwhelm our medical system, and many, many people would die. Okay, so whether it's between 2 and 10, anywhere in the middle there, it's all a very, very serious uh, illness that we would have to uh, really be concerned about. All right, um, it is believed that people can be reinfected. All right, now that one you could take as sort of a not certain yet, but there has been some uh, reports that people who have been infected and then recovered later contracted it again. All right, now if that's true, and certainly it's true of many viruses, right, we can contract things and then over a period of time the antibodies wear off and we can contract it again, often with reduced symptoms, but sometimes not that it may not be the case. So it's not sure yet about this COVID-19, whether or not people can be reinfected and how serious the second infection is. Now, what I did see, and this is just reporting, it's just rumors not confirmed, is that some people had contracted it a second time and they were suffering heart failure when they did, all right? It's possible, I don't know if that's true or not, but it certainly would be alarming. The fourth one is that clearly this virus is very easy to spread, all right? You don't have to look any further then past the, the Diamond Princess cruise ship and how easy it spread among the passengers and crew, even when they were locked down in quarantine, all right? So this is obviously a virus, unlike Ebola or something, which is difficult to, to contract from person to person. This is very, very easy to spread between people. It's airborne, we know that for sure. When somebody sneezes or coughs, the little micro droplets can go out and people can breathe those in or touch something that's been infected. And it may last on surfaces for maybe up to nine days. Now, again, we don't know that number, maybe less, maybe more, but that's a long time. Uh, if you think about, you know, some kind of micro droplets get on something, and then you know, a week later, somebody comes into contact with it and touches it and then touches their eyes or their nose or something and manage to contract the virus. That would be very dangerous. Um, it means the virus is around for quite a while. The fifth one is it can be spread before symptoms show up. That's confirmed. So a person can feel perfectly healthy and be spreading the virus to others and not come down with and not have shown any symptoms yet. All right, so that's very troubling because it makes it almost impossible to screen people, right? Somebody, you can take their temperature, they don't have a temperature. Do you have any coughs? No, no coughs, no sneezing, you're fine. But they're actually carriers of the virus and actually able to transmit it to others. So this is particularly troubling. People may remain contagious 
sometime after their recovery. Now this is just now being reported, so I don't know that it's been proven yet. But the idea is this, a person gets sick, they ultimately recover. The thought is that if you've recovered, then you're no longer able to pass along the virus. But it seems to be, at least from what I have read, that that may be possible that people who have even recovered for a short period of time are able to transmit that virus. All right, again, take that as just rumor, but again, that would be very troubling. And then finally, I just want to leave you with this idea that this COVID-19, this coronavirus, is not like anything we've ever seen before, not in my lifetime anyway. I'm 54 years old. So in the last 54 years, I cannot recall of a time when there was an outbreak of something where we sealed off countries, okay, and sealed off cities um, the way that they have in China. And I believe this is only just the beginning of those quarantine type things because now the virus is in numerous cities all over the world. And if it takes off and starts to grow exponentially in one of those locations, any one location, if it starts to grow exponentially, they'll have no choice but to try and quarantine that area because if it gets out and spreads exponentially, the entire world could potentially be infected, all right? So I think that because of this uh, being so unique and such a grave threat and nations reacting accordingly, you should also take this as a serious threat. Clearly, this is not something like just an annual flu outbreak. Um, it's more akin to something like the Spanish flu, which was back in 1918 and 1920, which killed roughly maybe around 100 million people and infected about one in three people all over the planet. All right? If something like that happens now, you can imagine the amount of uh, devastation that would cause. Now, we have a, something working in our favor that it won't become something like that, and that is that we have a great medical now versus what we did in 1918. There's a lot more things understood about um, um, different kind of viruses and how to combat them, develop uh, vaccines and so forth. But on the other hand, we're also a very interconnected world now, right? You can go anywhere in about 12 hours in the world uh, through these, you know, through airlines and through, um, you know, all these various nexuses and hubs that people connect through. And so you can get that virus spread all over the world much, much faster than you could have in, let's say, 1918. All right, so that's working against us in this case. All right, so these are just some of my observations, all right? Just, you know, take these, uh, what they're worth, just, a, a, like I said, a concerned citizen passing on my observations to you. Um, I'll also offer some preparations, specific preparations that you might consider taking to just get a little bit better prepared for what might be coming from this, all right? Now, it may not happen in the next month or two. It may not be until next year that this thing really explodes. But I do believe something is coming that's going to be very significant to our planet, and I think it makes sense to just try and get ready for it. Okay, now let's talk about a few basic preparations you might make just to get a little bit better prepared. All right, so I've listed out 10 preparations, and I will say that these types of preparations are really spelled out in great detail in my handbook to practical disaster preparedness for the family. Now, I address things like pandemics and many other types of threats as well in that handbook. And it's really a good general guide, okay? Now, I'm not here trying to sell the handbook. I'm just, if you don't already have a good reference book um, that talks about, you know, respirators and water purification and, and food, food storage and so forth, look to get a good book, all right? I think the book that I put together is really pretty exhaustive, but if you like another one, just use a different one. But just really do some research to get better prepared. All right, so let me run through these basic 10 preparations here. The first one is... Stock your cupboards, all right? Really go out and stock up on some food, all right? Now, I don't recommend running out and, and buying dehydrated foods or freeze-dried foods if that's not what you're used to eating, all right? Instead, just fill your cupboards with the food that you're used to eating. Now, a lot of people say, well, how much food should I get? It depends on the particular threat, all right? In this case, the whole goal of having stocked cupboards is so that you don't have to go out to the market and go buy food every three or four days and put you and your family at risk, all right? So at a minimum, you'd want to have 30 or more days of food in your house that you could keep everybody fed, let's say during the worst of things, right? That you know for 30 days you don't have to leave the house. Um, that might save your life, all right? So at least 30 days. A lot of people keep 60 days or 90 days or even a full year's worth of food. Um, but I think at a minimum, a 30-day supply is a reasonable precaution. The second one is store some water, all right? You don't have to store a lot of water. And in fact, it's difficult to store a lot. But usually a good recommendation is about two weeks worth of water you should store, all right? Now, some people say use about, plan about a gallon a day per person. I typically say about two gallons a day per person, which would include your hygiene as well as your drinking. Now, it's unlikely that the coronavirus would actually shut off the water supply, right? It's unlikely that people would become so sick that they couldn't run those utilities. But it's possible, all right? And if it's possible, you'd be in grave threat if you didn't have any water, all right? So, Again, it's just if you use bottled water, stock up on that bottled water so you don't have to run out every week or every four or five days and buy more cases of water. Be able to, to hunker down in your home for a period of time and not have to leave. All right. <clears throat> Third one is stock up on consumables. 
And those are just things like toilet paper and paper towels and paper plates and you know, things that end up getting used up, toothpaste and soaps and things that you don't want to have to run out to Walmart, you know, places where lots of people may be gathering, again, to get those basic supplies. So think about the things that you and your family use and just stock up on them. Uh, make sure you have several months of supplies on hand. That's not that hard to do for those type of things. Number four, and a lot of people are focusing on this right now, uh, especially in areas that are being hard hit by this virus, get basic protective equipment, all right? Now, you'll find that even though the vast majority of the planet is not being affected by the coronavirus right now, that already these protective supplies are in very short supply. It's very hard to find them. And they've already been price gouged where something that might have normally cost a dollar is now costing six dollars or something like that. Everybody's trying to make a buck. Um, so you may already be too late to get it cheap, but it's not too late to get them, all right? So what do you need? Well, I wrote down three things here. One is you need some type of protective respirator. And most people recommend these N95 masks. And I have one here. This is one by 3M. And there are many, many types. And they just go on your face. You want to find a, a respirator that will fit your face nice and snug and really make a nice seal around your face. And they don't all do that, all right? And so you want to find the right type that really seems to fit you well. Um, so again, these used to be everywhere you could find them for, for dirt cheap, and now they're very difficult to find unless you're willing to pay a premium for them. But it might be worth paying that premium to get a box of them, all right? And maybe a box of 10 or 20, depending on how many people are in your family, so that at least you have some way of protecting yourself. You also want some form of gloves. Those, these are still very easy to get. You can get some disposable gloves and then some type of glasses, preferably that wrap around the eyes or some type of goggles. All right, so at a minimum, those are things that you should look to get. And again, you don't have to rush out and panic and find them today, but because again, it's, the outbreak is not, at least in the U.S., not that it's just getting started, right? We're just starting to see handfuls of cases, a few dozen cases. So there's some time to go out and find those supplies, but make sure they're on your list of things you want to get. Now, one big problem with masks, gloves, and glasses, all right? Gloves are easy enough. You can buy boxes and boxes of those for dirt cheap. All right? the, the masks are ending up in short supply, so they're expensive. And you're not going to want to, so let's say you, go, you have to go to the store, you have to go to work or somewhere, and you wear a mask. Um, that mask could very well be contaminated by the time you come home. Small droplets of something have gotten on it. And the question is, how do we handle that? Well, if you just take the mask off, you've now contaminated your hands. And let's say the next day you put it on, you're not thinking and you're rubbing your, your face. You may have contracted the virus just from what was on the outside of the mask. So we need some way to handle that problem. And I'm going to address that in a separate video of how you address um, recontaminating uh, disposable face masks, all right? Um, so pay, uh, keep an eye out for that video. I think it'll be very helpful and very important. Um, gloves are easy enough. You can just throw away the gloves once they're used and get a fresh pair of gloves. And glasses you could wash in something like a bleach substance to disinfect them, all right? So keep that in mind, though. Each day that you come home or each exposure that you put yourself to, you have to treat all of those supplies as if they've been infected, all right? Number five, get in the habit of frequent hand washing. Obviously, the way much of this is spread is by touching something that's contaminated and rubbing your eyes or your nose or your mouth and introducing the virus, right? Now, you can get it other ways. You can get it through the air or through these micro droplets, but certainly you can catch it by touching things. And so get used to washing your hands frequently. You know, the old rule of thumb is 20 seconds is what you need to wash your hands. So most of us take about five seconds. So do a good long hand washing with soap. Um, and get used to using hand sanitizer when you're out and about and you cannot wash your hands. You know, get used to putting that on whenever you've come into contact with areas that you think might be infected. Number six, set aside some emergency cash, all right? When things get really bad, it could be that the banks and public centers are closing, all right? And you may not be able to get to your money. And so it's a good idea to get some amount of cash and keep it in some safe place uh, in your home, let's say in a safe or something like that. And don't advertise it to others, but have some money that if you needed to buy something, you'd have the ability to do so, all right? Number seven, you want to keep your medicines topped off. That's prescription and non-prescription. Now, non-prescription is easy. You can just go out and buy an extra supply of whatever it is you use. Prescription is a little more difficult because oftentimes you, your insurance will only pay for a certain amount of supply, you know, every 30 day supply every, every month or something like that. So you may want to talk to your doctor about if it's possible to get a prescription, a longer prescription, a 90 day perhaps, and try and keep those prescriptions topped off where you have plenty of supply and you're not having to go you know, to the pharmacy and try and get them refilled, all right? Number eight, put together an evacuation plan. Now by that I just mean what happens if it just 
luck is just not on your side and the outbreak occurs very close to you and, and the virus is spreading like crazy. Now, as people in China will tell you in the Wuhan province area, once they quarantine it, you're stuck, right? And that certainly could happen in the U.S. Make no mistake, we could definitely quarantine cities and areas. So if it starts to become an outbreak in your area and you do not believe you're infected and you want to get out of there, um, you have to have a place to go. You have to have a plan. And so come up with what that plan is. How are you going to get you and your family out of there in one piece? And number nine goes along with that. What supplies are you going to need to take with you? What kind of a bug out bag or, or a list of supplies, basic supplies are you going to take? And make sure you have those assembled and ready to go. And then finally, you know, like most disasters, it helps to not be doing it alone. It helps to have a network of fellow minded people, uh, people who are like also concerned about the virus and they're thinking about their preparations. If you can be part of that preparedness network, you know, you can be a much stronger individual. Your family can have a much higher chance of surviving if everybody's kind of looking out for one another, reminding each other of things they need to be doing. Maybe certain people store some things and other people store different things, all right? So if you can establish a preparedness network with your church, your family, your friends, groups like that, I think it'd be very valuable to you. It might help your chances of survival. All right, so these are all just very basic fundamental preparations, just 10 simple preparations that I thought might be helpful for you to be reminded of. Again, these and, and many, many more preparations are detailed in the Handbook to Practical Disaster Preparedness for the Family um, or any other handbook that you like, any other disaster handbook that you like. I encourage you to read those and draw some, uh, some lessons from those, all right? So I hope this was helpful. Now, my next video is going to be on that topic of, of how you handle the fact that you're going to be infecting your disposable respirator every time you go out, all right? And how you handle perhaps disinfecting it or the, the shortage of N95 respirators that are around, how, that, how you're going to handle that um, because that is going to be a reality that we're all going to face. All right, so keep an eye out for the next video. If you have any questions, feel free to post them.